Hi, this is Bob Weiss. I'm the host of Shaking Your World. Cheers. Welcome home. Yet another episode at Shakers. We are here to shake your world. And one of the most interesting things that I can think of in the sporting world is racing. So we're not talking about ox carts. We're not talking about dog races. We're talking about motor racing. Along with us today is a good friend of the house, Max, who's going to talk about racing. You are a race car driver. I am, Bob. First, uh, cheers and welcome cheers. home. Good Thanks. to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm fascinated by the entire concept of what I think you do for a living. If you don't mind, give us like a little background and kind of fill in the spots. Yeah, I have a bit of a unique start to racing. I really didn't do go-karting like most drivers do. I just kind of jumped in a race car when I was 18, learned how to drive uh, manual and that, and uh, happened to be pretty quick from the start and got some good opportunities and started working my way up uh, some of the motorsports ranks. And uh, here I am today doing some uh, sports car endurance racing. Very cool. So you're racing at Elkhart, I believe, this weekend? Correct. This weekend is the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Challenge. Uh, just had a race two weeks ago in Sebring, so pretty excited to uh, get back after it uh, with a two-week break here. Nice. So, uh, again, for everybody listening and my edification, you're not talking about, uh, this is not open-wheel cars. Correct. Okay. Yep. So let's go through the, what the vehicle is that you're driving in this. and. Yeah, so it's a French chassis. It's called BJ. We have a Nissan Power Plant V8. Uh, these are, they look kind of like a Batmobile. It's like a sports car. If you were to take it, make it very specific to racing. Um, some even compare it to like a Formula One car if you were to cover the, the wheels on it and put a little cockpit on top. So oh, cool. they're extremely lightweight, all carbon fiber, very aerodynamic, very uh, impressive machines. So you're talking about... A thousand pounds, fifteen hundred pounds, five hundred pounds. What are you looking at here? Yeah, we're about uh, twenty-two hundred okay. pounds when it's all said and done. Sure. Yep. Cool. And uh, so you got you got a ton of stuff going down the road. How fast does this thing go? Uh, it'll go about hundred and eighty-five miles per hour. Once uh, we have so much aerodynamics on the car that you get sure. to those higher speeds, you start to get a little bit of drag. Yeah. But uh, that allows us to brake and corner extremely fast. I bet. So if you actually had wings on the side, you could almost get you get a lift off, couldn't you? 185. Exactly. Oh, yeah. we could, yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so how are you doing this year? Uh, you know, we started out really strong. We brought it home in fourth at Daytona, and uh, last uh, two weeks ago here at Sebring, unfortunately, a competitor hit us from behind. My first in the car took us out and uh, destroyed our car. So really, really hurt us in the championship run. But we're sitting back in six right now. We just really need a strong weekend here at Road America, and we'll be right back in it. Occupational hazard, I'm going to guess that uh, you know cars bump into each other, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it so, happens. Uh, are you part, part of, of a? Game. Are you part of like the, a team that is uh, like three guys that are, you know, vying for the same spot, or how does that work? Yeah, so our, our team runs three cars. We have two drivers yeah. per cars. We have about 25 crew members, mechanics, uh, PR people, team owners. Um, whatever it might be, engineers um, that kind of make everything happen. I'm just contracted to show up and do my job, and if I don't, I'm out. So it's kind of how it works. Motivation. Motivation. <laughs> so and obviously you've got uh, sponsors on your shirt. Yep. So that's what makes the world go round. Yep. Um, by the way, it's a fine whiskey you have here from Johnny yeah, Walker. So uh, get a plug in, and yeah. then we'll wash that down some Perrier. Absolutely. So. <laughs> In the course of a uh, of a season, how long is a season, by the way? A season's about uh, our season's a bit spread out. We start in January, we go to October, um, with some breaks in between. It's about six weekends. Um, I was racing in the European Le Mans series, so that's back when I was doing uh, twelve weekends. But this year, due to COVID, it just didn't make sense to move forward with no. that program. So everything's impacted. So. Um, are spectators back at Elkhart? Spectators are back, but unfortunately our garages are closed off. The fun part for the fans is to be able to come see our cars, the see the mechanics work on them. Yeah. But we are going to have fans. There should be a lot of fans this weekend. We're just going to be disconnected from them, so sure. we won't be able to you know, engage so with the fans. So cheerleaders in the paddock, or that's gone too right That's now, all gone. Like, yeah. It's um, essential personnel only, unfortunately. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can debate that, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, how old are you? I'm t I just turned 27 a few weeks Well, back happy here. birthday. Thank you. 27, a wise old man racing cars. Exactly. <laughs> what is the uh, the general lifespan of a, uh, of a road racer? Uh, believe it or not, I'm on the older side of a, a racing driver. A lot of uh, these kids come from go-karts. They've been doing it since they've been four years old, and uh, 
race at a global level. Um, and I'm racing at 16 year olds, 15 year olds at times wow. that have actually more experience than I do since I got a late start. Um, wow. So it's interesting, but I mean, you can race all the way up to 50 if uh, you, if you keep sharp and the keep eyes uh, right first and foremost. Eyes, right? eyes are extremely time. important. Reaction yeah. time and. Uh, at some point, you start to realize you can get hurt doing this, and you stop taking risks <laughs> like you do when you're younger. You're, I guess, a little more wise, sure. one would say. So, um, yeah, there, there, there's a big gap. Some people retire early. It depends on how, how many crashes you get in, if you get concussions, all those types of things. There's a lot of different factors that go into it, sponsors, funding, all that. So have you got the uh, availability for uh, any merch attachments, merchandise, things that you get a part of, a residual or something as well? or? you know, calendar type things or something like that? or Yeah, we, we decided to do some uh, rebranding with my whole program this year due to COVID. So we are going to have a fan shop up on my website, which is uh, down at the moment as we're doing some development work. But yeah, I get definitely some profits from that if the fans are interested in some uh, MPH Autosport gear, which is my official uh, okay. branding for my, my racing program. And uh, yeah, we have hats, uh, tees, polos, all, all the fun stuff. Cool. So MPH stands for, and they are who? Uh, so that's me, that's Maxwell Philip Hanratty. Um, initials happen to be MPH, which is kind of cool. Miles and, per um, hour. Yeah. Miles per hour. <laughs> One would say I was born to race. But okay. uh, yeah, so uh, it was a, made for an interesting uh, opportunity for branding, having MPH. And I happened to get the domain MPH Autosport, which is uh, what shocked me that that was available, to be honest. And uh, decided to go with that on branding and got some logos done and ready to start uh, kind of pushing a little bit more there as we, we do this rebrand. Cool. So the, the great American story in a way is, is uh, you know, people getting their licenses, getting out there and just driving because we're all, we're all cowboys, we're all mavericks and we don't want that European kind of thing right. where we you know, can't drive in skate squares and things. So um, I, I'd have to imagine that your fan base has got to be from 11 years old to 60 years old, 70 years old, whatever, right? Because right, yeah. The, the demographic is just massive. The little kids are so intrigued by it the, the older people just love the mechanics of the racing sure. and they have a lot of experience with cars they're big car guys and they just love to see what we can do and there's people that you know really know the insides and outs of the of the sport and are able to really know to a deeper level what's going on and behind the scenes i want to talk about the mechanics in a minute but first i want to talk about that fan base so is it male is it female is it I gotta imagine you got a ton of groupies that are following the sport as well. Just the time I've been to Elkhart or any other race series, right. there are certainly, like any other sport, there are groupies that are yeah. there. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a male-dominated sport, I would say, okay. um, maybe generally like uh, early 30s to 50s. And okay. um, there's kind of been a little bit of a disconnect between the younger generation, which is why I developed some technology to um, kind of work to make the environment a little more um, intriguing to some of the, the younger crowd. Um, but I would say mostly male dominated. Um, you see more and more females each year. Um, most of them are there dragged along with their significant other or there with a, a group of friends sure. or whatever. But, uh, sure, how it starts at least. Yeah, it, and it depends on where we are in the country, what series it is. There's yeah. a lot of kind of moving pieces when it comes to that. What about like, a, you know, Danica Patrick kind of a thing? She's yep. done well for herself? Yep. Okay. Yeah, she was uh, extremely marketable. It was a male-dominated sport, and she was able to come in there, hang with the boys on the track, and do well, and uh, which made for uh, some strong opportunities for potential partners. It's... You, you want to stand out in racing, sometimes it's difficult to have the opportunity to do that. And uh, she came in and was a, a hot shoe right away and um, marketed her, herself very well. Uh, but no pink cars, right? No pink cars. You don't okay. see many of the pink cars, okay. unfortunately. You do occasionally if there's like a breast, breast cancer awareness sure. or whatever it might be. But um, yeah, usually straight right away from the pink cars for the most part. Okay. So the technology that you were talking about, you develop. You want to get into that a little bit, or? Yeah, I'll talk about it. Um, I just, I hustled for quite a few years trying to raise money um, from sponsors. I, I realized at an early age, not go-karting since I've been a little kid, I was gonna have to find funding if I wanted to have a career in motorsports. Um, so I ended up trying to raise sponsorship and I just really couldn't show sponsors a return with just a sticker on the car. So I was looking for some solutions. How can I better engage with the fan base? Um, these venues are, four mile tracks and there's bridges, tunnels, and it's hard to find different points of interest. Like if you want to go to the bathroom, you could walk a mile and a half and miss it. Um, if you want to find a concession or where like an autograph session is, it could be a huge waste of your day just walking. So I kind of 
was able to meet up with Hewlett Packard and uh, just kind of learn about some of their solutions and what they're doing with large public venues and uh, was able to implement some of that into the racing world, um, which we did our soft launch about two weeks ago um, up at Road America actually when IndyCar was in town and uh, we're going to have the app um, live this weekend as well uh, at the MC weekend. I think the last IndyCar race I saw had uh, Rick Beers in it, just to date myself here. Yeah, so he's uh, an absolute legend while. in the sport, yeah. so yeah, he's yeah. A, a great guy. So have you thought about uh, you know taking a drone and running that down your exact race course and developing a game that goes along with that as kind of the same thing that you see, so you know, camera mounted on, on both your car yeah. and then with the drone kind of thing above or behind you or something like that? Or Yeah, I think it's a it's a great concept. I know okay. there is um, some sort of drone racing. They usually try and like compress it though in a way just because I think the antenna can't really reach like the length of a track if you were to be standing ah, somewhere okay. so I think there is some functionality that's uh, lacking there but the, the concept of it I think there's gonna be something like that in the future whether it's remote controlled cars for racing or, or drones I think there's a, a lot of different ways the sport can pivot um, especially as things are going electric is a big fear for us right now is a lot of sponsors want to invest in Formula E um, and the electric uh, brands of racing at the moment just to uh, you know, get ahead of the curve if that were to be the future. Well, I presume that you have driven electric cars. I have. I've definitely driven the, the Tesla. I've never driven an electric race car, but uh, I got to give that a go, and I was pretty impressed. I'm telling you, car. man, I, I used to have some incredible muscle cars back in the day, but uh, right. 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds with my Tesla. Not too shabby. And it's just, you're, you're, you're flying, and it's just, right. it's immediate. You are just, you're there. Yeah. And uh, as much as I once upon a time ran open headers and, uh, you know, that growl is significant, yeah. it's not just you're there, but you're silently there. Yeah, you're silently there before yeah, you I'll, know it. It happened, yeah. yeah. So I, I do think that the, uh, the future, if not for electric, is certainly a hybrid just yep. because of Absolutely. all the power bands work yeah. whatever else. So, but that's got to be even more of an inducement for you to develop these other things because I can almost see a day, and I've been, I've been pimping... AI and mm. robotics for right. ever. And I think that we are probably close to, just because of the inherent risk and danger, which yeah. is part of the attraction as well, yeah. but there's also at some point someone's gonna say, you know, we, we just can't keep people getting killed anymore mm. racing, so we're gonna now have robots doing this, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, for me, that'll obviously be an extremely sad day. Um, my opinion on all that though, um, as far as like from the fan experience is I think augmented reality is gonna be a, a big part of it, being able to hold up your phone, see your favorite driver sure. and actually know like biometrics on the driver, you know, what tires they're on, what their strategy is. I think that's definitely the future. Um, those things are not cheap to develop, so I think those are already in the works. It's gonna so take like an, like an Oculus kind of thing or um, more so like uh, that's more like virtual reality like okay. put the goggles on and be able to physically like see like different I guess graphics mm -hmm. that would give you information but this is more so like hold up your phone and when and you're following the car on your phone some data would oh, pop like a up. heads up display kind of heads thing, up display okay. type yeah. thing I think cool. that's gonna be a, a, a potentially really big part of racing in the near future five years ten years what do you think it's that technology is getting really really good and yeah. I would say in the next five years that there's gonna be some level of that Cool. Man, the all-American dream in so many ways was getting that first car and, and you know, like just tuning that thing up and right. just having having yeah. that rocket within your parameters, you know. And that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I can just imagine in, in kind of a way what that's going to be. It's almost like a combination between like a Star Wars kind of thing, where you've got these these automated automated cars. glider yeah. type things, whatever. Yeah. And uh, then you've also got the rudimentary type thing, whatever they call the you know the. Star Wars 4 or whatever the yeah. new hope thing whatever it was uh, whatever um, wow very cool for you so aside from the little thing we're talking about augmented reality or AI or anything else what major things maybe a major obstacle do you think is coming your way not just you personally but yeah. you know, everybody who's got well, the balls I mean, to race I think right now just seeing everything going on with COVID, a lot of people are really making major shifts in their lifestyle and who knows how long, a lot of people are investing in that space as well to make you know, the digital life a little bit better. So who knows how long it's gonna to take to recover from something like that if we ever do. Um, we're already losing fans at the track just right. due to safety concerns and right. uh, multiple different moving pieces there. But um, that, that's a big concern for me is we lose the fans at the track and it becomes all digital. It's just. It's not quite the same, right? It's not being there, like smelling the fuel, the burning tires, being able to actually interact with the drivers. Sure. It's just very grassroots and very powerful, and that's something that 
I would not like to see go away, but yeah. it's kind of the way of the world at the moment, and yep. it's undoubtedly inevitable at some point here. So, um, just I gotta, I guess, hope that it's uh, there, longer than I expect. There's something about the smell of gasoline that is just <laughs> a, a wicked little turn on, isn't yep. it? And uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if, if uh, women get it the same way that uh, that I do, we do, but. Uh, Man, it is, it is an elixir of it youth is. in so many ways. I gotta say, a uh, business idea, some uh, fuel cologne, right? Burning fuel cologne. I don't know if it'll be hot with the sure. ladies, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you might have the wrong uh, demographic hitting on you there. But, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. So technologically, tires are just about at their zenith, aren't they? I mean, they're not gonna, what else can you do with a tire, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, I've seen some wild things I think out of Japan that were like not air filled but airless they had tires. Airless yeah. tires. Yeah. Is, is that an application for racing or? It is. I know that uh, Michelin is uh, testing airless tires okay. at racetracks. It's very closed doors as to what they're doing. Um, but I know they have like uh, street tires that are airless that they use on production cars. But uh, bring a uh, race tire is a whole different kind of situation. So. Uh, I know that's an uh, area they're heavily invested in and they're looking forward to eventually launching, but I think as of now it's more in the testing phase right now to see if it makes sense and see if it's at the right place to implement into the series. Well, you know, the, kind of the way I look at, at what you do is almost akin to what uh, the early days of aviation were, or even the way that I look at, at how uh, the space program was. Right. You got guys who are just uh, they're pushing adrenaline, and obviously you got big balls to do what you're doing because it could go wrong in a hurry, right? Right. And you've got a prize out there, and the prize is just to you know be faster than somebody else, man, and yeah. get the right strategy and move through. However, you do this kind of thing day after day or whatever mm -hmm. your schedule is. But um, people don't, I, I think, appreciate enough what the value of the space program was, or just of, of you know the the airline industry and, and right. how we have practical applications every day. Yeah. But I got to think that. Uh, car racing is much the same way. I mean, not just for tires and things like that, yeah. but you know, all sorts of things, right? Yeah, you get a lot of manufacturers, BMW, Ferrari, Porsche, uh, that invest a lot of money into these race programs because these are this is data they collect and things they learn for their production cars. Research and development, right? Exactly, and okay. uh, a lot of these programs help develop the next big supercar coming out. Sure. And uh, as you know, those aren't small projects, so yep. They take this to a whole nother level than just winning races. It's what can we learn to, you know, bring over to our production cars and and create a sex appeal that people want to buy it, right? You want you want to win races because some people want to buy your car and um, you see a, you see a big return that way. So uh, it's it, it's definitely extremely important. It's a big part of the sport. Without it, it would we'd lose a lot of funding. You know, once upon a time, it, it seems to me, and I, I unfortunately I don't have the time to follow a lot of things anymore. Um, but there were not just like the Enzo Ferraris, but you had Nicky Lauda, and you had, uh, who's the, the big Argentinian guy? You had people from really remote parts of the yeah. world that were yet in this really, really rarefied world that mm -hmm. you're in that are racing. Yep. And I mean, talk about a way to bring people together from, from everything. I mean, at one point bigger than soccer, yep. and it was, it was huge, this, mm -hmm. this dynamic opportunity to get in that car and just to, wow. Yeah, it was amazing in the sense that it didn't matter, you know, the color of your skin, where you're from, your background. It was just really about who's quick in the car and who's going to go and win races for us. And and that was that's the great thing about the sport is people are just such racing fans and so just engraved in winning that yeah. none of that really matters. It's just it's what's important is... Well, again, that's America. America was all, you know, we were yeah. about winning things at one point. We were yeah. about the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Le Mans, that had to be phenomenal for you. Yeah, Le Mans is an unreal event. Just, it's, I think, one of the largest spectator events in the world. You get close to half a million people there. Where do they um, put them? <clears throat> nowhere, to be honest. It's, it's so overfilled. There's people that travel hours and hours just to come for the day. Every single hotel is booked, you know, like years in advance. It's such a special event. Yeah. So, Monte Carlo, have you... I've, uh, I've walked the track, I've never raced there. <laughs> okay. um, I, I transitioned over from formula cars to sports cars at that point, so okay. never really put myself in a position to get up there. But, sure, um, it's like it, I it was, walked Pebble Beach, but. <laughs> yeah. But it, I will say it was, it was pretty surreal just walking the track, and you realize just how narrow it is, because on TV it just really doesn't do it justice, right. the track, for how fast these cars are going. So how, how wide is your car? Uh, I would say the car is about, uh, 
about five to six feet. Okay. Yeah, wide. So 60 some inches. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're barreling down this, this straightaway, right? Yeah. You're at Elkhart, you're barreling down this one, you've got other people that are mm-hmm. chasing you or you're chasing someone. How much space is there around you? Um, I would say if, if people really want to get risky, you could maybe fit three cars, but oh. you're going to have to, uh, there's going to be, we're talking inches between each car, so not a lot of room for air. And usually that ends to a crash. You, you definitely don't want to be the outside guy in that scenario. Yeah. Because it turns into a pinball in a hurry. Yeah. So um, you just got to be very strategic about situations like that. I, I do my best to kind of look at the big picture. We're here to win a championship, not necessarily just the race. Right. And if I'm going to make a pass, like the points aren't significant from second to third. So do I really want to potentially throw away my entire race and season to try and thread the needle in a position where it doesn't make a lot of sense? Yeah. So. Yes, I always call it a, a game of chess at 185 miles an hour. So it's you just really got to be using your head, and you can kind of get the the juices flowing sometimes, and you start to be a bit optimistic, and that's where things get dangerous. How do you control the? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you don't have anxiety about this, and you know people have anxiety about all sorts of things today, but you can't do that. You got to have a clear head, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you get yourself in the zone? And how do you prepare for a race? I mean, there's got to be some concerns about what you eat as well because yep. you've got to be at the right power zone or the uh, power band for that, right? Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll start with fitness. Um, so important. People don't understand how difficult it is to drive these cars physically. Well, you're an athlete. Yeah. Well, you are. Yeah. You're, you're an athlete. Absolutely. Right. There's always this argument that race car drivers aren't athletes, and I challenge anybody to get in a car and, and do what we do and be able to focus for as long as we focus. Um, I played very competitive basketball, football growing up, and a race is way more tolling on my body than that ever was, believe it or not. So, How long is a race, usually? Uh, a race is anywhere from two hours to 24 hours around the clock. So we do uh, endurance racing as well. So like I've done the 12 hours of Sebring, which... Uh, you're running around the clock for 12 hours. Granted, it's a it's a relay. You have some teammates. You have about two other teammates. But really, physically, the most that I've ever done in the car is three hours. And I got out of the car and I almost passed out. I had to crawl over to a seat. Um, just extremely dehydrated. Um, what people don't realize as well is uh, we're in a closed cockpit car. So when, let's say it's 90 degrees out inside the cockpit. It's about 140. Ooh. And you're in this big fireproof race yep. suit. Yep. You're... Um, putting about 400, 500 pounds of brake pressure every single turn and uh, sawing at the wheel. Um, the wheel's not light, so it's just extremely physical. What does that G-force do to you, by the way? I mean, long term, there must be an impact with all that G-force, just yeah. like on pilots. So. I mean, it's definitely not good for your body. You're, you're very strapped in. Your, your bones are shifting as your body does. It's like hard to hold your neck up. Um, it, it's very exhausting as you're going through the whole process it kind of just it, it takes your breath away literally when you go through the turns you're pulling so many G's that you have to almost like hold your breath and there's so many vibrations you're like vibrating in the car like profusely as uh, you're going through these turns so there's a lot of little factors like that that just make everything a little bit more difficult yeah, yeah. what about NASCAR NASCAR, I, I respect what those guys do. It's uh, definitely not my cup of tea. I prefer to round break, turn round. left, turn right, and, and do all that. Um, yeah. That being said, would I would I drive one if I had an opportunity? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just I like to race, I like to compete. Yeah. But um, my, my passion is really at this point with endurance sports car racing, and that's okay. where I see my future, so putting my efforts sure. there. Sure. So obviously the turning, the hairpins, the chicanes, the whatever yeah. else, and just that opportunity to, to bear through that, the radius, right, yeah. and then all the way down right and yep. we do rain racing as well which nascar doesn't do so um we race in torrential downpours and and what happens a lot of people don't know this but there's a racing line and the rubbers come out and when you hit those rubbers the car is like it's on ice you can turn in and the car just slides over the rubber and catches at the end of the track so is that part of hydroplaning or is that it's just part of those oils that come out it sure. creates this like ice like okay. texture on just the racing line so you have to know like i'm going to hit this patch of rubber i'm going to slide right over it have no control of the car and then it's going to barely catch at the edge of the road so you have to position yourself knowing that that's going to happen who doesn't want that <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun doesn't yeah, it yeah it's a ride cool so, you know, again, Emerson Fittipaldi's guys yeah. like that. You've Roger. got to be thinking in the back of your mind, these guys were just doing this kind of thing. And even back, I suppose, 100 years ago, right, yeah. when, when cars were first created, the motivation was yeah. there. You know, you got that, I got that, let's go, right? Yeah. And uh, just what an incredible rush that has to be, every part of that. So aside from the little merch thing and the engineering thing and, you know, maybe this other game idea we could talk about. Yeah. 
where do you want to go with this? Because, again, you said you're kind of the on the older side of this, so you got yeah. like 10 more years, I'm going to guess, yeah. right? Yeah, so my dream is always to own my own team, okay. uh, be the money guy, and then race for the team. So sure. if you own the team and you bring the money and you control your own destiny, you can pick the experience that you create for your team and drivers and sponsors. So like a Paul Newman, David Letterman kind of thing? Or? Yeah, like a, like a Paul Newman, I would okay. say. Yeah, I would I would like to you know have the pace of all the pros, but be the guy that brings the money. So be able to bring the best talent into my team, have the best equipment, and put ourselves in a strong position to win races. Um, so it's really the hardest thing you can do in racing is raise the money, but it's literally the most important part of the sport sure. at the moment. So that's somewhere that I put my focus versus a lot of other drivers hope to just make it on talent alone. And yeah. I, that's really, for me, a lot of them I see hanging up because... Big picture. You know, they, not everybody can get that right. one spot. So Yeah, it's just, um, you know, it's hard, especially when you're younger, you're you know, 14, 15 years old and you need a million dollars to go racing, you got to go sit in front of a board and, you know, justify this to them and, and show value. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, not only do you have to have, you know, connections to decision makers, have the idea, the presentation, and then the confidence in you to deliver on everything. Um, so it's just, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And it's, I truly believe that the experiences I've been through, you know, doing that is going to position me at some point if racing were to not work out to have a, a strong, uh, you know, some strong opportunities in business. So when you're uh, in life on the road, if you will, no pun intended, it has, yeah. to be, uh, it has to be a challenge by itself. Relationships have to be fair to possible, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just, just the, the simple things about what you're eating, what you're doing, maintaining the regimen, uh, the physicality of that has got to yeah. be a huge challenge. How do you how do you cope with that, man? I want I want to hear about the human side of this. You know, it's it's difficult. A lot of ups and downs. Like you see a lot of your friends, they're able to go out and you know party a little bit, have some fun, just relax, um, like do these things that you really you give up as a kid and as you as you grow up here. And and not only that, but if you know everything falls through, you lose your ride, your opportunities financially. You're not going to be sitting too well, and you're going to have to kind of restart. So it's just a massive risk and. Um, like you said, it's hard to, to develop relationships and stuff like that. You just got to be fully in tuned and focused on the process and what you're doing. Because um, if you're not doing it, someone else will be, and they're right. going to you know, kick your ass when it comes to right. uh, race day. So. so here and now, here and now, at all times, you got to just maintain that little thing, an important thing. Cool. So you're smoking a cigar. Yep. Kind of amazing. Thrust, thrust uh, that upon you. Amazing Fuente. Um, as you know, it's one of my, my vices, helps me kind of get away from the craziness of racing. It's, uh, I call it my meditation zone a little bit. I get a, when I want to think about sponsorship deals or just think about things around in life, I like to you know, go sit down, have a cigar, and unwind a little bit. It's just a, a form of meditation for me. I think that's really the case that, again, a lot of people don't appreciate, especially cigarette smokers or people that are just, you know, oh my God, that smells so bad or something yeah. else. But I, I've known an awful lot of, of very successful people in my life who are myriad careers and professions but not everybody but a vast majority of people that I know yeah. really find solace in this mm. it's contemplative and, and it really opens a lot of doors you can go to a bar anywhere and you're smoking a cigar and there's another guy smoking a cigar you have someone to have a conversation with if you want to and it's not this stifling kind of thing and it's not this little arrogant kind of thing that some people think as well it really I think brings more people together and in many ways, it is really part of that human experience. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see, obviously, we met because of this. I'm glad yeah. to see that you uh, partake yeah. in this. Whiskey, um, I prefer scotch over bourbon, but I like them both. Um, As do I. Yeah, As do I, go. yeah. Definitely my uh, drink of choice on the road. And uh, Bob, just going back to what you were saying about, uh, you know, this bringing people together. It's, it's been such a great thing here at Shakers, you know, bringing... I feel confident bringing family, friends here, even clients to you know talk some business. And a time or two, I've met a few well-connected people up at the you know up at the bar and gotten some uh, connections to them. So um, that's why Shakers has always been a bit of a special place to me. And uh, you know, living in New York now, I don't get to come through here quite as much. So I always look forward to it uh, when I'm in town. Well, thank you. So uh, you know, you're, you're obviously you've seen a lot of the world, right? Um, favorite meals. 
I'm a big fan of doing, I know it's overpriced, but the whole kind of Michelin star type thing. So I've, I've been fortunate enough to eat some nice meals in south of France and, uh, you know, just try a lot of different things with wine pairings and all that. I'm a bit of a foodie and uh, really enjoy those experiences. It's just, it's cool to see how some of these establishments take it to the next level and really focus on the experience and attention to detail. South of France, Northern Spain, it's all food porn, yeah. baby. I, I love every <laughs> part of that and the way the spirits and the wine in particular interlink with things. Um, if you had one favorite dish, if you close your eyes, and yeah. that's the place I want to be at right now having that thing, what would it be? I'm a massive steak guy. Um, I like like anything with a bone in it. So like a bone in, tomahawk, <laughs> ribeye, anything like that. I love when they take it out, chop it up for you, put a little salt on top. I'm um, that and a nice uh, Cabernet, and I'm I'm in heaven. So you have a preference for Cabernets? I really like uh, this winery out in uh, Napa Valley, Chimney Rock. I think it's one of the the best bottles you can get for the money. It's uh, about south of a hundred most bottles, and it's just a fantastic wine. Um, actually, I'm a member at the club there, so I get some shipments and. Um, I've, I've never really had a, a bad bottle of wine there, and it just uh, goes really well with everything. You can drink it alone, and uh, yeah, it's always been a very nice wine for me. If you weren't racing cars, what would you be doing? You know, I've always had um, a big passion for marketing, but I do love to cook. Uh, since I've been a little kid, my, my mom's kind of taught me to cook really everything around the sun so that's something I've been doing more of as of late I would love at some point to own my own restaurant and kind of use some of my experiences from racing and traveling and doing maybe all one day we'll cook together on something there you go I would so love that could be, uh, could be a lot of fun <laughs> so a lot of people don't think about uh, food probably with the the, the smells of the uh, of the petrol and uh, the tires and everything else that goes along with that but uh, Clearly, you know, the you have to have some cash to race cars. You've yep. got to be uh, able to sustain a certain lifestyle right. to be following racing as well, um, which allows you the opportunity to uh, to enjoy some incredible food and wines and spirits. So I understand that you got this quirky little thought that you'd like to have something taking place in the paddock, maybe where yeah. it's an elevated food experience aside right. from the, the norm. How do you kind of picture that taking place? I would just love to, I love to host people. I love to, you know, bring a lot of people together, have a good time and create experiences for them. And a lot of the food at the racetrack can be very, you know, blah, it's like concession stand food and in some places just don't do it right. So I've always had a vision to bring some very upscale type of events for our own personal sponsors. So talking about doing snails? You're thinking beyond snails? I mean, snails, uh, lobster, steak, some good fish, you know, some nice wine pairings, just sure. kind of some cigars for dessert, you know, just kind of bring a lot of those players together to kind of sponsor some events like that and sure. create a, an ecosystem like that within the, the race environment that really stands out. I can see putting together a program right now and uh, hitting up like Bon Appetit and, yep. uh, or Gourmet or whatever and yep. uh, getting them to, to back this project and sponsor this thing mm -hmm. and to, uh, to move this whole thing forward. I think that would just be dynamic for you and maybe that's, yeah. that's your future as yeah, well. Yeah, maybe that's my niche. Yeah, who knows? I mean, just... Uh, you know, through some of the experiences over in Europe and eating at some of these restaurants, I think there's, get a couple of smart people together, put our heads together, and we could really knock that out of the park. So definitely Perfect. something I'm interested in. Is it, uh, is it better to race in Europe or in the U.S.? For what uh, you're doing? I mean, I love the, the tracks in the U.S. and it's where I started my racing, so I'll forever be grateful to it. But I do have to say the racing in Europe is just incredible and the fans are just above and beyond some of the you know the autograph sessions we have you feel like a star you have like eight nine cameras in your face you got lines out of the paddock trying to just get your autograph even when you're a you know a no name in the sport so I, I, I would agree with you because uh, as as a chef and uh, with my own product food product line um, I would get people asking for autographs here whatever else yeah. but when I'm in Europe yeah oh chef oh, 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 oh. <laughs> a lot you bigger know? deal yeah absolutely yeah. so it's uh, it's interesting how different cultures, societies embrace different parts of, of what we do. But again, you, you to be that guy that's racing that car, that is, it, it, you know, I don't want to say it's like a warrior-like kind of a thing if you think <laughs> about, you know, the old Greeks or something, yeah. but it is, it is truly something that most people can't do yep. and certainly shouldn't do. <laughs> I even talk about how fast my Tesla is, it's faster than most people should be driving that car. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so I also talk about uh, you know, so the, the Tesla is, is crazy sleek and it's, it's fast and it's all sorts of things. It's a great ride and, you know, whatever, it, it catches eye appeal. 
Um, but I also have this this old Alfa Romeo that yeah. is the soul of driving because mm-hmm. you're working that gearbox and it's not remotely as fast. It's maybe quick, but it's fun, man. Mm-hmm. It's just so much fun. So I can imagine just the opportunity for you to change different vehicles and get on these things and just let her rip and, and take it through those turns yeah. and just man yeah, that's gonna be a rush it's quite amazing the the technology is getting a lot better though like when i first started i had the classic four speed you know gearbox so i had a clutch and downshift and blip it um and i kind of went up to the sequential where you can just kind of throw it in gear sure. and now we have the paddle shifters yeah paddle so shifters you plus, like those by the way i do because you can really focus on being on the limit the process okay. of driving and, okay. and racing you just kind of you know you can left foot brake and you go into the turn and you can just kind of you just kind of like you know pull a lever versus having to have one hand on the wheels the car yeah, is yeah, kind of yeah. twitching in the brake zone so i've i've, I've driven a, a couple of the new alphas and uh and they've got the paddle shifters and it's it's a real cool setup kind of thing but i if I'm shifting, I, I, you know, there's just something. I'm, yeah. I'm way old school. I'm way older than yeah. you are. So, you know, just that that synchronous motion between, you know, the clutch and what you're yeah. doing, and you slam it around, and and even the opportunity uh, to to drive in England where it's backwards. Yeah. For that, me, it's that'll backwards. throw you off a little bit, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've, I've had to do that when I raced in uh, at Silverstone Circuit out in London, and uh, that was uh, it. Took a bit to get used to. I, I turned down the wrong street at, at one time, and. It was just uh, a bit confusing, but uh, you figure it out after a while. Yeah. Once you see the headlights coming at you, it scares you enough to, sure. you know, think a little bit harder. So your your favorite place to race in the world? I gotta say, and uh, not just because I'm from Milwaukee, Road America is just such a, a special place. It's the the track is phenomenal. The fans are amazing. Uh, the food is actually quite good there. Uh, one of the, believe it or not, one of the concession stands has a Michelin star. The only uh, track in North America to, to do so. Is that run by uh, Kohler, perhaps, or? It's uh, it's called Gearbox. Okay. And um, it, it's just been known for over the years for having amazing food. They bring in a big smoker. They do things really well. You just really wouldn't expect the quality of food you get from it. And well, it, it blows a lot of people away, and it actually draws a lot of fans to the track. Cool. Max, this has been wonderful having you. I really appreciate you taking the time out because I know this is your, your race week. Um, I'd like to, you know, we should cook together sometime and do a, do a little gig or something. Yeah. But this has been a blast, and uh, thank you so much for coming in, and best success to you. I'm not sure if it's break a leg or what you say in your industry, <laughs> but best success, brother. So uh, cheers you. to you. Hopefully bring one home for the Milwaukee crowd, and uh, Perfect. Ho- hopefully bring it home on the top step this weekend. So Looking thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs>